Amen. I'm so glad he did. If you have your Bible, Ephesians chapter 1. I'm going to give Rick a minute up there, but if you have your Bible, Ephesians chapter 1. I am thankful that everybody has been patient with us without Sheila here as we're trying to figure out the best way to do everything. So Ephesians chapter 1, and and we're going to start in verse 20. If you would stand one more time, and I'll leave you alone for a while. Ephesians 1 and starting in verse 20. The Bible said he demonstrated this power in the Messiah by raising him up from the dead and seating him at his right hand in the heavens. For above every ruler and authority, power and dominion, and every title given, not only in this age, but also in the one to come. And he put everything under his feet and appointed him as head over everything for the church, which is his body, the fullness of the one who fills all things in every way. Let's pray this morning. Most gracious Heavenly Father God, we just thank you for your word. We thank you for for everything you give us through your word, the promises that you give us, God, the hope that you give us. And God, most importantly, the love and the sacrifice that you gave for us, God. God, we just, again, thank you for this opportunity to be in your house. We just ask that minds and hearts would be clear this morning to receive your message, God. Allow each of us to put aside the, the worries of this world, God, for just a moment. And just worry about what you would have to say to us to take us through this week, God. And God, just just give us what we need. We ask all this in Jesus' most precious name. Amen. So as we enter into this Christmas season, and yes, I know we just finished Thanksgiving. Sorry to rush ahead, but the month of December starts tomorrow. And some people may be ready for December just to be over and be done with 2020 and move on. I'd say most of us are probably there. But as we enter into Christmas season, we, we remind ourselves why we celebrate Christmas. We, we know it's for the birth. We remind ourselves that Jesus came as a baby born into grim circumstances to one day do something unimaginable for us. So as the birth is important to us as a Christian, however, this morning I, I feel as though at Christmas we tend to only look at the birth. We, we only see the first part of the whole picture um, I, I know many Christians that, and, and maybe you would be in this group, and it's okay to be in this group, but would say that Christmas is their favorite holiday. I, I will tell you from my perspective, I, I like Easter. It's my, it's my favorite. Well, why? You don't get together with family. Well, sometimes it's better to not get together with family in my experience in my life. But I, I look at Easter as, as the most important holiday because of what Christ did for us as Christians. Uh, we, we look at the birth, and obviously the birth is important. Um, he, he, he was born as a, as a baby, so we were all able to go uh, to him. He, wasn't, he didn't come as a king. Uh, if, if you know much about, well, even the look at the president, you can't just go talk to the president of the United States. In, in ancient times, you couldn't just go to the king and, and talk to him, okay? A lot of times when you did, things worked for the best. But we almost push out of mind, though, at Christmas time, the sacrifice that, that Jesus offered for us. Though coming to the earth alone was a sacrifice, we look at, at Christ, and we're going to touch on this later, he sat at the right hand of the Father, the most important spot in ancient times. We're going to look at why the right was more important. But though coming to the earth was, alone was a sacrifice, the power that God displayed through Jesus is beyond our understanding. And when we really think of the power that God gave, we have to really look at the sacrifice that, that Christ offered. So with all that being said, we need to realize the power of God. So this morning, we're going we're to talk about that, the power of God. But think for just a moment of, of his power on display for many people. We, we can look at the parting of the Red Sea, and I've never seen water just move like that. I've seen a wave, okay, but I've never seen the water just split in half. Think about that for just a minute. I, I, I think of parting the Red Sea, and so often we just, ah, well, God just used it. Yeah, he did. But if we really look at what the text says, and it says they walked on dry land. It doesn't say that it was still moist or had a little moisture to it. It said it was dry. I don't know about you, but me and my brother and my dad played golf on on Friday. I don't get to see my brother very often. went and played golf. And Taylor hit a few into the bunkers that were now water hazards because there was water this deep in the bunkers. I don't know about you, but when water dries up, it doesn't just dry up. It leaves something behind. There's still some moisture to the ground. As we'd walk through the fairways and it just on the ground and you'd just continue to sink in some spots. But we can look at, at life that way as well, and especially the part in the Red Sea. And, and God, when he makes a way, he makes a way. He doesn't just do it halfway, he does the whole thing. 
We can look at, at the plagues before that, and obviously we know that God caused them time after time again, and probably most powerful creating something from nothing. In Genesis 1 and 1, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And verse 2 continues, now the earth was formless and empty. Darkness covered the surface of the watery depths, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the surface of the water. So we can look at Genesis 1, and we can see God at work. In the beginning, he created something from nothing. Power in the Bible, though, has a deeper meaning than what we might think. When we think of power, we think of some big, strong person. Now, God being a big, strong person, we can think of that as well, but it's frequently used as a description, the strength of the mind or moral qualities of a person, power of a person's faith, and so on. So it's not just the strength that they have, but when we think of it from a spiritual sense, it's the the strength of their mind, the moral qualities that they carry around. How often do people look at one person and go, well, you're you're a moral person. No, they make fun of the person because they don't do the things that, that we do, or they do, I should say. A person's faith, the power in, in faith is so beyond our understanding. We, we believe in something that we don't even see. We can't put our hands on God, right? But if you read scripture, you see God time and time again talking to people going, hey, I'm talking, you're not listening. How often does he do that in our own lives? So it, it means that this person or, or God, and this was the def- definition I was looking at this week, has some inner strength that does not depend on outward things. The God that we serve has strength that nobody can understand because he doesn't depend on other things to bring strength. We, we can look at the coal mines and we can look at, at, at ethanol plants and all these things that we use to create energy. And we create things out of, out of the things that God's given us. But God doesn't depend on the coal mines for his strength. He doesn't depend on ethanol plants for his strength. He can do it all on his own. Why? Because he's God. And I know outside of these four walls, people look and go, that's not a very good answer. Okay, let me move on then. God's power doesn't come from science. I could sit here all day and say that, right? It wasn't created in a big bang. If there was a big bang, I'm going to tell you who did it, and it was God. Why? Because he's an eternal being, an infinite being that has and will always be. It says in the beginning that God's spirit hovered over the earth. He's been here longer than this earth has been here. And, and you can look at science all you want, and the earth is 75 billion years old. I don't, I don't know, okay? I can do the math on, on biblical people, and it's about 6,000 as far as our days go. But that's since people. There's a few days before that. Who knows what happened, right? But the point being is that God doesn't need, he doesn't need us to be powerful. He, he doesn't need us to define him. He doesn't need us to be powerful, but he wants us to lean on his power. So, so often we try to do things on our own, and, and we think, well, I, I can do it on my own. I'll, I'll be okay. Sometimes you've got to ask for a little bit of help. And sometimes we've got to ask the people around us for help. But the first person we should seek their help is, is that of Jesus Christ and that of God. Why? Because they know us better than the person that we live with knows us. As hard as that is to admit sometimes. We, we've known these, this person. I've lived with this person for this many years, okay? My parents have been married 30, be 33 years next year, okay? They probably know a little bit more now than they did at three years, Right? But they still don't know everything about that person. Why? They don't know the numbers of hairs that's on their head. Now, it may be getting easier to count dads than than it used to be, okay? If he watches this video later, he'll get on to me. That's okay. I don't care. So so the first thing, though, that that we really need to see is is God's power was on display in Christ's resurrection. In verse 20, it says, He demonstrated this power in the Messiah by raising him from the dead and seating him at the right hand in the heavens. So, Though Christ suffered, though he lived a life like us, spent in in hatred from others, um, if you read the Bible, Jesus wasn't a liked person by most people because he told them what they were doing wrong. Nobody likes to know what they're doing wrong. They don't want to know what they're doing right, okay? I've gotten to where I'm used to knowing what I've done wrong because 
Somebody will tell me. Sometimes it's my wife. She's just not, she's a good layer at me. I'll get slapped for that later. It's okay. But, but God used the circumstances that Christ went through, that we go through, to show how powerful he is. See, see Jesus knew what was going to go on. He didn't know the timeline, but he knew what his job was to do. God knew the timeline. God knew everything that was going to happen in those years that Jesus walked this earth, the good, the bad, and the ugly. So, so God, God didn't need us to show how powerful he was. He needed to show us, though, right? He didn't need us to show, but he needed to show us how powerful he really is. So if your circumstances are bad, remember what God did through Jesus. See, see we look at our circumstances on a daily basis and say they're so bad that I can't go on. I lost my job a week ago, okay? I could have sat at home and pouted about it. Guess what? I'd still be sitting at home pouting about it. Nothing would have happened, right? So often we look at the things that are going on, and we don't look at the God that gave us the ability to get up in the morning. So often we we take for granted just that first breath in the morning, we open our eyes because we're too busy going, is it time already? I don't want to go to work. I don't want to get up yet. But we take for granted that God's given us another opportunity. He's given us another day. So Jesus' circumstances were as bad as they can get, right? 33 years he walked this earth and he lived a perfect life. Several people have said, and Emily's dad has said it time and time again, that Annabelle's very well behaved. And every time he says it, she starts crying. I'm not kidding. It happens every time. They were upstairs painting yesterday at her mom and dad's house. And they're like, oh, she was so good the whole time. I said, yeah, that's because you had the radio so loud you couldn't hear. <laughs> Trust me, she was crying. Don't worry. But my, my point is that, that Jesus had the worst circumstances they could get, yet he lived a perfect life, an unmarked life. But this, this power that, that God used through Jesus Christ is available in us as well if we would allow God to use us. He demonstrated this power in the Messiah by raising him from the dead and seeing him at the right hand. So, so we can look at Christ's sacrifice and he died for our sins, but that wasn't enough. Because guess what? If Jesus had just died and stayed in that tomb, we would still be lost and undone. Nothing changed. He gave his life. Okay, a sheep gave its life every year, but it didn't come back to life, right? They sacrificed the animals every year, but, but it only covered them for so long. If Jesus would have stayed in that tomb, somebody else would have had to come and do it again. But God knew that, okay, I, I've got to do something different this time. He knew exactly what he was going to do. Genesis 1-1, he knew that he was going to do this. But through our connection to Jesus and, and Jesus being raised from the dead, our, our sins weren't left in the tomb. They were carried away. And the Bible says as far as the east is from the west, I'm going to stop there for a minute. Trying to explain as far as the east is from the west to some kids in Evansville is more difficult than the kids in the country. I'm just going to throw that out there, okay? They don't understand the east and west motion, let alone where they're at. And, and, and we would talk about that with them, and you would try to explain God, God threw your sins away as far as the east is from the west, and they go, how far is that? And you'd have to get a globe out. <laughs> Let me show you. I can go this way all I want. I'm not going to go the other direction, right? But if I start going north, what's going to happen when I get to the top? I'm going to start going south. So they're like, well, why didn't he say north to south? Okay, it's different. It's not the same concept. The earth is round the last time I checked. But so often that we, we, we look at the things that go on in our life and we don't realize that our sins are nowhere in sight to God. He's thrown them away. Why? Because he doesn't want to view us that way. He wants to view us with the blood of Jesus Christ on us. My sacrifice for you is sufficient. But through our connection to Jesus, God can invade the circumstances in our lives and demonstrate how sufficient he is. He, he, doesn't, he doesn't need to, to do anything for us. He's already done all the work. Amen? He's already sacrificed everything. He didn't have to do any more for us. I say it a lot, and I'll, I'll say it, you'll hear me say it a lot, I should say. But God's already taken the step towards us. He's done all the work. He's come so far. Now we've got to take a step towards him. Even us as Christians have to take a step towards God sometimes. Hey, God, I've, I've slid back a little bit. Let me step back in. 
The second thing I want us to see is we see the power in, in Christ's placement and we continue the second part of, of verse 20. And seeing him at his right hand in the heavens far above every ruler and authority, power and dominion, and every title given, not only in this age, but also in the one to come. So, so God not only raised Jesus Christ from the dead, and, and I realize we know all these things that I've said. This is nothing new. But maybe it's a different perspective we haven't looked at. And as we get closer to Christmas, obviously we're going to talk more and more about the birth. But I feel it's important that we take a minute and realize that God not only raised Jesus from death unto life, but he also raised him to the second seat, to the right hand. See, in, in some countries, even today, the right hand is the right way to be, and the left hand is, is not. They put it this way, they wipe with this hand, okay, and they shake with this hand. I'm serious, this is other religions. And guess what happens if you get caught for stealing? They cut your right hand off. Why? Because they want you to know that you messed up. And when people see that you've only got one hand, guess what? They don't want to be anywhere close to you. So when we think of the right hand, we have to think of the right side of things. I'm left-handed, so I disagree with this, but it's biblical, okay? So I can't exactly disagree with it. I'm the only one in my right mind if you're not left-handed. You'll get the joke later if you didn't catch it. But he, he, he promoted him to the right hand, to the side of importance. Why? Well, God's still number one, right? But Jesus did all the work again because God said, hey, I need you to do this. For the people that we created together, I need you to do this. And I think he thought of us as individuals, even some almost 2,000 years later. I think he looked and he saw each of us that are here this morning and said, I want to die for that person. I, I solely believe that God did that for us. But Christ's placement to the right hand not only glorified Jesus, but also helps us. Romans 8 and 34, I think I wrote that down right, who knows. We'll read the verse, and if it's not right, well, I'll have to figure it out later. Who is the one who, could, who condemns? Jesus Christ is the one who died, but even more has been raised. He is also at the right hand of, of God. Don't miss this part. And intercedes for us. So, so he died, and he was raised to the right side. But not only was he for his glory, but for our intercession. So he... He was not only placed there at the right hand to glorify himself, but to help us. We have somebody that's on our side even more than what he was before. Why? Because he walked this earth. He knew the sins of the world. He knew the struggles that we went through. At 33 years old, he saw enough of life to realize the things that go on are not fair. People are going to make mistakes time and time again. But he intercedes for us. The power that God offers is available because of where God placed his son. We can go to God directly through Jesus Christ because of his sacrifice for us and because of where God placed him. Placement is, is key in life. We, we, we look at and, and we can look at any situation and, and the boss that you have, their placement there is either a good thing or a bad thing for you, Right? In the long run, it might be a good thing, but you may see it as a bad thing. Placement is key in this world that we live in. Christ has the right, though, because he's placed there, to override or veto our decisions. That doesn't mean he's going to do it every time. But if we make a decision that's not what he would ask us to make, we're going to know it eventually. When I was 17 and God called me to, to preach, and I was 17 and was not up for that, okay? Most of you heard this story. But God has a way of catching up to you. I went and played college sports and I got hurt within the first semester. Why? Because God was still trying to get a hold of me. It still took another year because I'm a slow learner and a slow listener. That's okay. But, but God has the right to veto our decisions and go, hey, I was asking you to do this and you went the other way. Let's try this again. I look at Jonah and, and Jonah ran the opposite direction of Nineveh. How often do we in our own lives run the opposite direction of where God's calling us to be? Only if we align our lives, though, under his rule will we then see his agenda demonstrated in our circumstances. So we come back to circumstances, right? Why? Because God's power is glorified more and more through the circumstances that we go through. 
So often we see the bad things as a bad thing, but in all reality, God's using it for his glory because he placed Christ at the right spot at the right time for us. But we have to align our lives under his rule. We don't like to follow rules sometimes. I spent uh, Tuesday night, Wednesday night, Thursday night at my mom and dad's house in my old bedroom. Still a little weird after three years of, of doing this back and forth. And, and the rules that I can remember as a, a teenager, obviously are not the rules now. I don't have rules. I can just come and go as I want. I still got a key, which I'm sure they're going to change the locks one of these days. But, but the point is that if, if I was to do something in my parents' house, they have the right to veto my decision, right? It's their house still. I may be 26 and my brother 29, but it's still their house. This is God's house, right? And God can decide what we're going to do, but we have to align our lives to follow. And the third thing, and I'll wrap up shortly, I promise. So 20 more minutes, no, I'm just kidding. We see the power in the church in verses 22 and 23, and it says he put everything under his feet and appointed him as head over everything for the church, which is his body, the fullness of of the one who fills all things in every way. He appointed him as head over everything for the church. So God appointed Jesus to be the head of the church. There's many parts in the body, right? But everything's got to go through the brain to cooperate. So if we look at Jesus as the brain of the operation as he is, right? If one part of the body isn't doing something that the brain wants it to do, it will correct it to an extent. So Jesus has been given to the church, only the church, operating under Jesus' authority can give the world, though, a picture of what life under God's authority looks like. Operating with, under Jesus' authority, the church, can give a glimpse to the rest of the world what God's authority looks like. Everybody's going to go and get to see the gates of heaven. Everybody will see the gates, but not everybody gets to go through the gates. Think, think for just a moment about that. If you were lost and undone and you got to see the pearly white gates, but then you were told you couldn't enter. You've seen heaven. You've seen perfectness. But then you get the boot and you go to hell. Think of the agonizing pain that that would cause. Obviously at that point it's a little late to make your, change your mind, right? <laughs> it's a little late. But we as the church have to allow God to lead and guide us. Why? Because if we don't allow him to lead and guide us here, the world's not going to listen to us out there. The world's not going to listen to anything we have to say if we're not aligning ourselves under what God's power has, and his authority has given us. So Jesus was given to the church and only the church. That doesn't mean that he doesn't care for the people, right? Because guess what? Ellis Mound isn't the church that he cares about. It's the people that are the church that he cares about. This is just our corporate where we're going to gather, right? But the more the church does the kingdom missions, God's will, okay? So the more we do God's will, the more the church will experience his presence and his power. Well, guess what? That's not just when you're here, okay? It starts at home. We, we think of, of what the kids learn in school, and guess what? It starts at home, what they learn. When we talk about the Bible, it starts at home on how much we dedicate our time to reading the Bible. We dedicate our time to our prayer life. So the more the church does God's will, the more we will experience his presence and his power in our lives. And guess what? If we experience it more, we're going to be more apt to share it with somebody else. We're going to be more apt to go outside of these four walls and go, okay, I, I need to share what I learned this morning. Why? Because I feel a little closer to God today. Our goal at church isn't to come and feel good. So if you come to feel good, I'm sorry, I'm going to burst your bubble. And Emily's not in here, but she knows I'm not a Joel Osteen fan. Okay, I'm not a feel-good pe sermon person. I, I, I want you to feel good about your life, but not because of what I said, because of what God said through me. Okay, But my point is this, that I'm not going to get up here and tell you that your life is perfect and that you're just doing great because God wants you to do great. No. It's not going to happen. Why? Because God hasn't given us everything. So we can just, oh, well, I'm, I'm good. I don't need anything. No, he's given us his son so we 
can look at him and go, I don't need anything else. God's power doesn't just come before the church. We must be willing to depend on God. He, he won't just show up. We've got to be willing to invite him week after week. God watches everything that we do, and, and, he, and he does care about everything that we do. But he's not just going to show up if we're away from his will. We, the church, have a big load to carry. Whether we want to believe that or not, we as Christians have a big load to carry. Because we don't represent myself. I don't represent this church even. The first thing that I represent is, is God. When we go outside of these four walls, I, I don't care what your name is. I don't care what your job is. You should be willing to direct people to God in the way that you talk, in the way that you work, and just the way that you live. And granted, I know that's easier said than done. I've been in the, the jobs where the lingo isn't the best language that you could use day in and day out. I've been in those jobs when they don't care what you have to say. But say it anyway. Why? Because God's power didn't grow just because we quit talking about it. Right? God's power grew, the gospel grew because they were willing to put their life on hold and talk about Jesus. They were willing to say enough of what I want and more of what God wants. I'm going to ask that you would stand for just a minute. We're going to close. I told you 20 more minutes. I think I kept it under that. We're doing good. But the power that God has given us, he's done all the work. Again, I'll say it again. He's done all the work. We've got to take a step towards him. This morning, this invitation time we're going to have, if there's a need in your life, this altar is going to be open. I'm not going to force you to come up here, okay? I'm not going to prolong everything if you don't come up here. But I find it's important we as Christians realize that we're not enough. We need God's power in our lives. We need God to show us some days that we're not enough. Most gracious Heavenly Father, God, we just come to you thankful again for this day that you've given us. God, we're thankful for the power that you've shown us, God, in our lives, God, and, and through your son, Jesus, and sending him to die on a cross for my sins and the sins of the world, God. God, we thank you for that sacrifice. God, the power that you've given us, God, is only because you love us. And God, we thank you for that love. But God, we just ask that you would help us. Help us to realize, God, that there's still work to be done. That though your power is infinite, God, that there's still things that can be done to glorify your name here. There's still people that are lost and dying to hell every day. We ask that you would help us to be a witness. Help us to be a light to those people, God. Not because of anything that we do, but because we're willing to let you live through us, God. God, I just thank you for everything you do for me in my own life, and I, I just ask that you would forgive me where I've failed you. This time of invitation, God, just to allow hearts and minds to, to come to you, God. Just allow us to be what you would have us to be as a church, as individuals, God, as your followers. Again, we're thankful for this opportunity. We're thankful for those that are here. Again, God, I would just ask that in this invitation that you would be glorified. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.